the, uh, the idea of the open story. Um, let's see, is um, an attempt at uh, uh, revisiting somewhat the, the concept of the story as such. If, if I, in any case, the, the kind of concept of story, the story that um, um, we, we did inherit from certain traditions, uh, a concept of a story which is today uh, um, uh, questioned, including within those very traditions, if only because of the advent of all kinds of devices and technologies that allow us to uh, think differently about this. Uh, the story as, for instance, having a beginning, uh, intrigue, a plot, um, and having a, a, a denouement. Uh, if we are to take just those three uh, elements. Uh, so so some, some idea of theory of uh, uh, where, of the, let's just call it the origin, uh, there is uh, uh, an originary moment, uh, and then there is a, a deployment of uh, a long, it can be one line or multiple lines, uh, depending on how the plot is, is uh, uh, manufactured, and not so more uh, a unique kind of, 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 of decision. Uh, uh, the denouement being, being a moment of decision. And that there's no story without a decision. And that to some extent, the moment of decision is uh, an agonistic moment, um, and a bit more than that, because the decision really basically has to do with, with, with whether or not to take, take life, to take the life of the character, uh, or to, to, give, to give life, to let, to let live, if you want, uh, to paraphrase uh, Foucault. That has been the case in a number of cultural traditions. <laughs> but there is also a case in other traditions where, you know, stories like a, a mosaic of forms with multiple doors, one can enter here, get out there, come back, begin from the middle, not necessarily from the origin, begin from the end, um, with all risks attached to that, of uh, a kind of labyrinth in which one is trapped, uh, and therefore the act of living consists constantly in uh, surmounting obstacle after obstacle, <coughs> or, or allowing oneself to undergo process of conversion or transformation without end, which, which have no end. And, and Seth and I and have had this discussion before. Uh, one such kind of story is Tutuola story, uh, Amos Tutuola, who, who many people thought was a traditionalist, but who is now discovered, in fact, by all those who are working on on new media as uh, an epitome of uh, uh, plasticity and, and, and complexity. So that at the intellectual level. But your question is more specific. The way in which an open story creates a polity. See, and that's, that's where the, the, the complications start. Because to some extent, first of all, not whatever polity, uh, to what extent does it create democratic polity, I, I would add. At a time when uh, democratic form is even not exhausted, or this is, as I said, a fa certain fatigue about it, that it doesn't uh, 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 allow for firm decisions, uh, 
it leaves us unprotected, so forth and so on. And here, I don't think I can give you one single answer, one definitive answer. Seems to me that there are traditions of the political that are premised on some idea of certainty. And most of them, most of the modern traditions of the political are premised on that, both democracy and authoritarianism. You have to know, you have to classify in order to be able to act, you also have to foresee see in advance, prevent, as a way of managing risks. That the political basically is a form of redistribution of risks. The ones you really don't want to take for yourself, you externalize them to some, some other person or other group. An open story, if taken seriously from a political point of view, allows us to imagine a different kind of policy that is not premised on the management of risks or the simple redistribution of risks and their allocation to uh, those who are weaker, those who are poor, or those who are not like us. An open story allows us, for instance, to imagine the idea that origins are fundamentally multiple. There's not one single origin. The originary space is a space that is itself disseminated. It's not one single space. But what we see today is a return to the idea that there's one origin which I can identify properly, I can name, and which allows me to make a distinction between those who are from here and those who come from somewhere else, for instance. But when we look at some African stories, or some stories of African migration, the origin, when they talk about the origin, is always about coming from somewhere else. The politics of origins in African stories of migration is a politics of coming from somewhere else. It's a politics of some people on the move. And who, uh, because they are on the move, either through trade, war, or not, constantly amalgamate others. The amalgamation, the openness to that which is really not mine, but which if I add it to who I am, allow me to become more powerful. It's has always been about that. So, it's about composition. That history is about compositional processes. And the person who really talks very vividly about a number of historians and anthropologists, of course, the person who summarizes the best is an anthropologist called Jane Dyer. In a, a very important piece in the Journal of African History called Wealth in People, Wealth in Things. The big division today that Daniel walks in between people on the one hand and things. Where is it that wealth resides? Does it reside in people or does it reside in things? And African pre colonial traditions, most of them, suppose that wealth resides in people and that things are like a currency that allows us to accumulate people. So the accumulation of people is the way in which we constitute wealth. So you have that tradition, but you also have a tradition where people can be dispensed of. During the slave trade, I mean, you sell people. You sell people partly because Africa has always faced a serious problem of how is it that you, you put your people to work? And this, for purely geographical reasons, is a massive continent. So, if you want to put me to work, meaning exploit my, my labor, I can just leave. I leave and I establish another community policy somewhere else. So, the exit 
option is available, which is very different from societies where the number of people is bigger than the space they inhabit. So the easiest thing, since I cannot put you to work, you to work for me, it's easier to send you to somebody who wants to give me something else. But that's a very complex discussion, uh, which shows that, in fact, of course, there are different imaginations of what the political is. But the, in this age of ours, the best kind of story that is likely to allow us to re-inhabit a world that has become, to a large extent, an in, uh, inhabitable is the open story. It's not a closed story. Now, on questions of reduction and expansion, you see, uh, uh, it wasn't, I mean, uh, you think there are many things you have in mind when you have to speak in the time constraints and you make a shortcut. Um, and then, anyway, the uh, uh, the discussion there uh, had to do, if you want the, uh, the, the what is behind, the recognition of the fact that we we do not we are not the, the sole inhabitants of the world, and I mean maybe maybe we had that sense earlier on, uh, but it didn't lead to many consequences. So maybe today what's going on is that. Um, that sense is becoming more acute, and uh, we are some are organizing to draw the consequences of, of that awareness. Uh, and that drawing the consequences of that awareness has become one of the central political issues of this century. So, second, uh, the idea then that if we are not the sole inhabitants of a world that is a planet that is no longer extensible, that the planet has reached its, its limits, uh, we cannot extend it any longer, which is very different, for instance, for, from the 19th century, when we could always go somewhere else and colonize. We can no longer do that, uh, or in any case, not in the same terms as earlier on. That the planet has become smaller, the sense has become smaller, and that our own survival depends on striking a kind of modus vivendi between all its inhabitants, animate and inanimate, all the species, the term to the meritis, the meritis species term, which we observe, for instance, in anthropology. I don't know whether that's the case, but I think so. It's Come on, or the, the case too in, in, in literary discussions. I was just reading uh, Catherine Hale's number of them uh, who are literary scholars. They have picked up on this too. Uh, the multi species term. Uh, and which politically then uh, allows us to uh, imagine different redistribution of, of, of power between, between inhabitants. The fact that agencies share, mentioned that. All of that in a context in which the capitalist system, but I keep coming back to that, I and mean, then you, you will think, oh, anyway, uh, I just think that there's nothing we can say about our current conditions if we don't pay attention to those material forces of which capitalism is the prime example. It's going the other way. <coughs> It's going in the other direction because of, if you want, entering in an age of total deregulation. Of which, by the way, experiments in deregulation, we have been the laboratory of deregulation. If you do study this thing historically, it's always somewhat out of Europe that deregulation the regulation practices have been experimented for the first instance. Part of what is today the pillars of neoliberalism, they have been first experimented outside of Europe. So, what it means is that, for instance, in a place like, like South Africa, 
and we're discarding all kinds of people. The mineral industry, when I came here 16 years ago, counted almost half a million people, a bit below, 400,000 and something. Today, uh, it's more than, less, less than half of the 400,000. And this is not simply because the mining industry is not making enough profits. Of course, it's still making profits. Of course, it's still investing offshore. Of course, it's still sitting on piles of money that are not put in circulation in the economy. So it has nothing to do with the mining industry not making profits. But it has shed half of the numbers we had in the beginning of the year 2000. A lot is still to be done, not only here but also in the rest of the continent. And the big scandal is that there are no jobs. How is it that we reconcile the fact of the immensity of the needs and the uh, absence of, of jobs? It's because capital is no longer really interested in ex exploiting anybody or everybody. Let's see, let's put it like that. It's not. It doesn't need to exploit everybody. It means that the danger, the big drama today, is no longer the one Karl Marx and the others were talking about. The fact of being alienated in the process through which you sell your labor. The biggest drama today is to not be exploited at all. <laughs> that is the big drama. To enter into a regime of superfluity where you are not needed. The masters do not need slaves any longer. But slaves need masters. So how to be a slave in the absence of a master has become the serious problem. It's the biggest problem. So the question of people and things, that's how I try to reformulate it in this context. In that context, for many people, it's better to be, like, I mean, if I'm a dog in um, Santa, <laughs> or even in parts I know where I live, I mean, they are dressed. The other day I was walking to go to the shop. It's winter in Johannesburg, I mean, it's, it's winter, uh, figurative, because we have the best weather in the world. I think it's, it's a bit cold in the evening, but, but not that much. So I met two dogs really dressed with properly clean uh, coats. <laughs> and they were, they were served. They were served by two, I guess these are foreign uh, Africans, who have to survive one way or the other. So I met that they were speaking French, so it's dog, ah, come on, leave, you know, where do you come from? And, and, and I mean, that's, that's the job they have every, every day to, uh, so if I were a, a dog, um, in Santon or in Park Town, no, I will be treated really well. I would have uh, insurance in case for, uh, I'm sick. I will eat every single day. I will be treated very well. But now we're talking about an animal. Uh, if I were a thing, I'm sure that under certain conditions I would also be treated better than uh, a human being. So you have that, and you have the other massive fact that today we can no longer think of the human without all these, our extension in, into things, into cell phones, into computers, into all kinds of objects that have become the tempers somewhat of our everyday life. So that's what I had, I had in mind, but for that, I think Sean would have to organize another international conference and uh, <laughs> hope to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.